His Excellency Ambassador Armando Berricchio, thank you very much for this speech, so important for us scientists, and for granting me the honor of introducing and moderating this session on research, an engine of growth, to celebrate the Italian Research Day in Berlin. As a founding member of the recently created association SIGN, Scienziati Italiani in Germania Network, I would like, first of all, to thank his Excellency, the Ambassador, for the impulse given to us, the many Italian scientists and scholars active in Germany, to gather and meet in this new association and here in the Embassy, um, a bilateral think tank on science, technology and academia, which promotes good scientific practices and activities between Italy, Germany and Europe. The creation of this association would not have been possible without the constant engagement and coordination role by the scientific attaché of the embassy, Professor Vincenzo Fiorentini, now flanked by Professor Pier Giorgio Alotto. Many thanks to both of you, from all of us, uh, for your work and for the organization of today's event. Uh, my name is Chiara Franceschini and I am, since 2016, a university professor for art history at the Ludwig Maximilian University in München. Munich, after having previously worked in the UK, France and the United States. Having myself a vast experience in managing, a relatively vast experience in managing international research projects in art history, the humanities and heritage studies, I'm very happy tonight to have the honor and the opportunity to introduce the five illustrious colleagues who, from different perspectives, different disciplines, and different career stages, will contribute to our common theme, research as an engine of growth between Italy, Germany, and the world. Um, I don't say anything, I will introduce uh, every speaker, spe speakers, but just for the organization of the evening, each talk will last circa 10 minutes for a total of, total of uh, circa one hour after which there will be time for discussion open to the floor. Uh, so I encourage, therefore, all the presents to take notes already of questions to ask to the individual speakers at the end of the five presentation. And now it's an honor to introduce as a first speaker of our panel, Director Sakura Pascarelli, a physicist, a daughter of an Italian diplomat and born in Tokyo, Sakura Pascarelli graduated from Rome Sapienza University after a PhD from the University, Université José Fourier de Grenoble. She was for many years head of the Matter at Extremes group at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in Grenoble and responsible for the X-ray absorption spectroscopy lines. <laughs> she is currently scientific director at the European XFEL in Hamburg, X-ray free electron laser, and member of the scientific committee of the Stanford Synchrotron Light Source. Her research uh, focuses on the study of matter under extreme conditions of pressure, temperature, and magnetic fields, but she will tell us much more, better than I can do, about this research and her ex uh, experience as a director of this important facility. Please join me in welcoming Sakura Pascarelli. Thank you very much, uh, Chiara. Thank you very much to all of you here. I don't know, ah, is, am I going to change the slides? Or somebody, okay, maybe I will do it. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. As Chiara said, my name is uh, Sakura Pascarelli, so Pascarelli is Italian, very Italian, and my parents are, uh, were Italian, so I am Italian. But uh, Sakura is a Japanese name, it actually it stands for, um, cherry blossom in, 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 in Japanese, and I was born in Tokyo. Maybe this is a pointer, yeah. So I was born in Tokyo, and uh, I traveled when I was a baby, a young child, to, to the US. Then I went back to Rome, and uh, uh, I did my um, primary school in, in Burma, and uh, high school in Indonesia, and when I was 16, I traveled back to Italy. And in Rome, uh, as Chiara said, I uh, graduated from uh, La Sapienza in Roma. Uh, I have a laurea in physics, a degree in physics. And uh, after that, I uh, won a scholarship uh, by the uh, Instituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare 
to, um, to work at the uh, LNF laboratories, Laboratorio Nazionale di Frascati. And uh, in 1993, I moved to France, Grenoble. And I was sent there actually to contribute to the construction of the Italian uh, beam line at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. This is a, a European research center that uses X-rays to study matter. And initially I was there with the one-year contracts paid by INFN and then by INFM, the Consorzio uh, Fisica della Materia. And then finally I was recruited by the ESRF and uh, I stayed there many years. And in 2019, I moved to uh, Germany, Hamburg, uh, when I was appointed uh, scientific director of the European uh, X-ray Free Electron Laser. So this is uh, my career in a nutshell, and I will tell you a little bit about uh, this uh, facility. So the European XFL is an international user facility. Uh, it is funded by 12 shareholder countries, and Italy contributes to about 3%. Um, it is located in Hamburg. <clears throat> this is a photograph seen from the top. So Hamburg is here on the bottom right. So you see here the DAISY campus. DAISY is a large research center in Hamburg. And the European XFEL and DAISY collaborate on this project. XFEL uh, constructed and operates the X-ray laser. And DAISY constructed and operates the accelerator. So this is the source of our electrons underground. This is a two kilometer long uh, accelerator. This is the longest uh, radio frequency accelerator in the world, electron accelerator in the world. And it produces uh, therefore world record uh, electron energies and therefore these electrons then also produce uh, world record high energy photons, so X-rays, which are then distributed in different tunnels and used by uh, large teams of uh, researchers underground in these large labs, about 3.5 kilometers from DAISY. So the construction started in 2009 and uh, operations started in 2017. As you can see here, this was the inauguration uh, of the end of the tunnel construction in 2012. This is the big uh, uh, tool that was used to dig the tunnel. So, so this is a very big facility to study tiny objects. As I said, uh, the photons produced here have a record energy. And you may know that uh, when you have electromagnetic uh, radiation, uh, the highest the energy, the smaller the wavelengths. So the wavelengths that uh, we have here approach the angstrom, which is uh, 10 to the minus 10 meters. This is the distance between two atoms. And so we have the resolution to see atomic positions with these X-rays. At the same time, uh, we produce bursts of X-rays, very short pulses. These pulses are of the order of a few femtoseconds. Uh, a femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So you can imagine that this, the pulse length is like the time of the opening of a shutter in a camera. So uh, the faster the shutter, the faster the di dynamic processes that you can follow. So we have a camera that can make movies of processes, very fast processes, but with a spatial resolution of the order of the atom. So we can see actually how atoms move. So whereas the 20th century was, was let's say, the century where ultra-fast science was done with optical lasers. So you could only see scales of the order of the micron. This century will be the century where movies and with ultra-fast science will be carried out with X-rays, with this atomic resolution. So I've picked two examples of this kind of science that we do, and we do a lot of science that is really directly related to solving some of our big societal challenges. This is one of them, which is in the field of environment and sustainability, and it actually is devoted to understanding how we can attack the problem of um, you know, purifying water. So today we have 2.2 uh, billion people on the earth that do not have access to, to drinkable water. And in 2050, half of the world population will be in water stressed areas. So this is a very urgent problem. And um, so what we're doing is we are now studying uh, these copper complexes. So copper is cheap, you can find it everywhere. And these copper complexes can be uh, just dropped into water and react, they, re they, they um, are activated by sunlight, which is also relatively cheap, and they turn the oxygen in the water into a very reactive oxygen species that attacks the bacteria and kills them. So this is a very cheap, sustainable uh, tool 
to uh, purify water. And we've been doing quite a lot of work on this. The second example is on energy. As you know, this is also a pressing issue, especially now in Europe. And we're looking for new materials, you know, cleaner materials, more sustainable. And uh, as you know, hydrogen is uh, one of the most important fuels that we are uh, considering for the future uh, energy economy of the coming years. And one of the most promising ways to produce hydrogen in a clean way, in a sustainable way, and also in a large scale, is using electrochemical water splitting. Now, the problem is that electrochemical water splitting works very well, but it requires uh, catalysts, which are very expensive, and use these metals like platinum and iridium. So they're very expensive, more expensive than gold, and there's not much. We've already used most of them. Uh, and so we are now trying at the European XFEL to substitute these catalysts with cheaper materials based on 3D metals like cobalt, nickel, iron, um, and uh, this is work which is led by P.I. Giulia Mancini from the University of Pavia, and they came already several times, and uh, they have very, very interesting results here that will very soon be published. Okay, so that was just to give you a little bit of uh, a clue of what, what kind of research we do. A little, bit, a little bit of numbers. So as I said, Italy contributes to about three, a little bit less than 3%, and our shareholders are CNR and INFN. Uh, but, you see, the Italian staff, uh, the scientific staff, is much larger. It reaches 8%. And actually, if you look at this pie, you can see that we are the second country in terms of population at the European XFEL, just after Germany. Also, the scientific use is steadily increasing. It started very low, and now we have just reached, well, at the end of 22, the percentage of our share but the projection from 23 is approaching 5%. So this is a very rapid growth, uh, probably also linked to the fact that I joined the facility three and a half years ago, and I've been activating you know, the Italian community. Uh, I mean, even the fact that I've been invited many times to the embassy, I think this is also uh, quite positive for the European XFEL and for the Italian presence there. So Italy has also contributed with in-kind contributions. Actually, they made a very important contribution to the construction of this accelerator because of the historical expertise in constructing uh, superconducting uh, radio frequency uh, electron accelerators. Um, Yes, and so finally, uh, we also have many Italian scientists in pivotal positions. So the experiments we do at the European XFEL are all, all evaluated by international uh, scientific committees and in independent uh, peer review screening. And we have 10% of these members that are Italian. Uh, we also have one fourth of the uh, European XFEL user organization executive committee, which is uh, composed of Italian members. And finally, and this is most important, at the European XFEL, so remember the numbers, we contribute less than 3%, we are 8% of the scientists, but we occupy 21% of the group leaders' positions. So this means that Italy is actually extremely present and controls a big chunk of this big facility, right? 21% of the group leaders, so a big chunk of the leadership. Finally, uh, a little bit about the scientists that use this facility. So we have more and more groups coming from many different universities. These are the most, uh, let's say, the ones where we have most users from. We've had, we've had 132 user visits up to now. And um, we're also fostering young scientists. So when I came, I set up a, a program for uh, shared PhD students. Uh, where we are sort of, uh, you know, supporting young students from Italy. Uh, we pay half of, the, of, the, of their PhD project. The other half is paid by the Itali Italian university. The students come to the European XFEL, they spend time with us, um, and then they go back to the university and they bring, you know, they bring knowledge, they bring expertise, and this then remains within the university. So this has been a very effective way to uh, have Italian universities getting more involved in the science we do. And that's it. Thank you for your attention.